Chapter 2 I spent the months following my grandfather's death cycling through a purgatory of beige waiting rooms and anonymous offices, analysed and interviewed, talked about just out of earshot, nodding when spoken to, repeating myself, the object of a thousand pitying glances and knitted brows. My parents treated me like a breakable heirloom, afraid to fight or fret in front of me lest I shatter. I was plagued by wake-up screaming nightmares so bad that I had to wear a mouth guard to keep from grinding my teeth into nubs as I slept. I couldn't close my eyes without seeing it, that tentacle-mouthed horror in the woods. I was convinced it had killed my grandfather and that it would soon return for me. Sometimes a sick, panicky feeling would flood over me like it did that night, and I'd be sure that nearby, lurking in a stand of dark trees, beyond the next car in a parked, in a parking lot, behind the garage where I kept my bike, it was waiting. My solution was to stop leaving the house. For weeks I refused even to venture into the driveway to collect the morning paper. I slept in a tangle of blankets on the laundry room floor, the only part of the house with no windows and also a door that locked from the inside. That's where I spent the day of my grandfather's funeral, sitting on the dryer with my laptop, trying to lose myself in online games. I blamed myself for what happened. If only I'd believed him, was my endless refrain. But I hadn't believed him, and neither had anyone else. And now I knew how he must have felt, because no one believed me either. My version of events sounded perfectly rational, until I was forced to say the words aloud. And then it sounded like, uh, then it sounded insane, particularly on the day I had to say to them, I had to say them to the police officer who came to our house. I told him everything that had happened even about the creature, as he sat nodding across the kitchen table, writing nothing in his spiral notebook. When I finished, all he said was, great, thanks, and then turned to my parents and asked if I'd been to see anyone, as if I wouldn't know what that meant. I told him I had another statement to make, and then held up my middle finger and walked out. My parent y parents yelled at me for the first time in weeks. It was kind of a relief, actually, that old sweet sound. I yelled some ugly things back. That they were glad Grandpa Portman was dead. That I was the only one who'd really loved him. The cop and my parents talked in the driveway for a while, and then the cop drove off only to come back an hour later with a man who introduced himself as a sketch artist. He'd brought a big drawing pad and asked me to describe the creature again. And as I did, he sketched it, stopping occasionally to ask for clarifications. How many eyes did it have? Two. Gotcha, he said, as if monsters were a perfectly normal thing for a police sketch artist to be drawing. As an attempt to placate me, it was pretty transparent. The biggest giveaway was when he tried to give me the finished sketch. Don't you need it for your files or something? I asked him. He exchanged raised eyebrows with the cop. Of course. What was I thinking? It was totally insulting. Even my best and only friend Ricky didn't believe me, and he'd been there. He swore up and down that he hadn't seen any creature in the woods that night, even though I'd shined my flashlight right at it, which is just what he told the cops. He'd heard barking, though. We both had. So it wasn't a huge surprise when the police concluded that a pack of feral dogs had killed my grandfather. Apparently they'd been spotted elsewhere and had taken bites out of a woman who'd been walking in Century Woods the week before. All at night, mind you which is exactly when the creatures are hardest to see, I said. But Ricky just shook his head and muttered something about me needing a brain shrinker. You mean head shrinker? I replied, and thanks a lot. It's great to have such supportive friends. We were sitting on my roof deck watching the sunset over the gulf. Ricky coiled like a spring in an unreasonably expensive... an unreasonably expensive... Adirondack chair my parents had brought back from a trip to Amish country. His legs folded beneath him and arms crossed tight, chain-smoking cigarettes with a kind of grim determination. He always seemed vaguely uncomfortable at my house, but I could tell by the way his eyes slid off me whenever he looked in my direction that now it wasn't my parents' wealth that was making him uneasy, but me. Whatever, I'm just being straight with you, he said. Keep talking about monsters and they're going to put you away. Then you really will be special ed. Don't call me that. 
He flicked away his cigarette and spat a huge glistening wad over the railing. Were you just smoking and chewing tobacco at the same time? What are you, my mum? Do I look like a truck stop hooker? Ricky was a connoisseur of your mum jokes, but this was apparently more than he could take. He sprang out of the chair and shoved me so hard I almost fell off the roof. I yelled at him to get out, but he was already going. It was months before I'd see him again. So much for having friends. Eventually, my parents did take me to a brain shrinker, a quiet, olive-skinned man named Dr. Golan. I didn't put up a fight. I knew I needed help. I thought I'd be a tough case, but Dr. Golan made surprisingly quick work for me. Uh, quick work of me. The calm, affectless way he explained things was almost hypnotising, and within two sessions he'd convinced me that the creature had been nothing more than the product of my overheated imagination, that the trauma of my grandfather's death had made me see something that wasn't really there. It was Grandpa Portman's stories that had planted the creature in my mind to begin with, Dr. Golan explained. So it only made sense that, kneeling there with his body in my arms and reeling from the worst shock of my young life, I'd conjured up my grandfather's own boogeyman. There was even a name for it. Acute stress reaction. I don't see anything cute about it, my mother said when she heard my shiny new diagnosis. Her joke didn't bother me, though. Almost anything sounded better than crazy. Just because I no longer believed the monsters were real didn't mean I was better, though. I still suffered from nightmares. I was twitchy and paranoid, bad enough at interacting with other people that my parents hired a tutor so that I only had to go to school on days I felt up to it. They also, finally, let me quit Smart Aid. Feeling better became my new job. Pretty soon I was determined to be fired from this one too. Once the small matter of my temporary madness had been cleared, had been cleared up, Dr. Golan's function seemed mainly to consist of writing prescriptions. Still having nightmares? I've got something for that. Panic attacks on the school bus? This should do the trick. Can't sleep? Let's up the dosage. All those pills were making me fat and stupid, and I was still miserable, getting only three or four hours sleep at night. That's why I started lying to Dr. Golan. I pretended to be fine when anyone who looked at me could see the bags under my eyes and the way I jumped like a nervous cat at sudden noises. One week I faked an entire dream journal, making my dreams sound bland and simple, the way a normal person should be. One dream was about going to the dentist. In another, I was flying. Two nights in a row, I told him I'd dreamed I was naked in school. Then he stopped me. What about the creatures? I shrugged. No sign of them. Guess that means I'm getting better, huh? Dr. Golan tapped his pen for a moment and then wrote something down. I hope you're not just telling me what you think I want to hear. Of course not, I said, my gaze skirting the framed degrees on his wall, all attesting to his expertness in various sub-disciplines of psychology, including, I'm sure, how to tell when an acutely stressed teenager is lying to you. Let's be real for a minute, he set down his pen. You're telling me you didn't have the dream even one night this week. I'd always been a terrible liar. Rather than humiliate myself, I copped to it. Well, I muttered, maybe one. The truth was that I'd had the dream every night that week. With minor variations, it always went like this. I'm crouched in the corner of my grandfather's bedroom, amber dusk light retreating from the windows, pointing a pink plastic BB rifle at the door. An enormous glowing vending machine looms where the bed should be, filled not with candy but rows of razor-sharp tactical knives and armour-piercing pistols. My grandfather's there in an old British army uniform, feeding the machine dollar bills, but it takes a lot to buy a gun, and we're running out of time. Finally, a 45 spins towards the glass, but before it falls, it gets stuck. He swears in Yiddish, kicks the machine, then kneels down and reaches inside to try and grab it, but his arm gets caught. That's when they come their long black tongues slithering up the windows, looking for a way in. I point the BB gun at them and pull the trigger, but nothing happens. Meanwhile, Grandpa Portman is shouting like a crazy person, Find the bird! Find the loop! Jakob! Why? You don't understand! 
you goddamn stupid yutsi. And then the windows shatter and the glass rains in and the black tongues are all above it, all over us. And that's generally when I wake up in a puddle of sweat, my heart doing hurdles and my stomach tied in knots. Even though the dream was always the same and we'd been over it a hundred times, Dr. Golan still made me describe it in every session. It was like he was cross-examining my subconscious, looking for some clue he might have missed the 99th time around. And in the dream, what's your grandfather saying? Same stuff as always, I said, about the bird and the loop and the grave. His last words. I nodded. Dr. Golan tented his fingers and pressed them to his chin, the very picture of a thoughtful brain shrinker. Any new ideas about what they might mean? Yeah, jack and shit. Come on, you don't mean that. I wanted to act like I didn't care about the last words, but I did. They'd been eating away at me almost as much as the nightmares. I felt like I owed it to my grandfather not to dismiss the last thing he said to anyone in the world as delusional nonsense. And Dr. Golan was convinced that understanding them might help me purge my awful dreams. So I tried. Some of what Grandpa Portman had said made sense. Like the thing about wanting to go, me to go to the island. He was worried that the monsters would come after me and thought the island was the only place I could escape them, like he had as a kid. After that, he'd said, I should have told you, but because there was no time to tell me whatever it was he should have told me, I wondered if he hadn't done the next best thing and left a trail of breadcrumbs leading me to someone who could tell me, someone who knew his secret. I figured that's what all the cryptic-sounding stuff about the loop and the grave and the letter was. For a while I thought the loop could be a street in the Circle Village, a neighbourhood that was nothing but looping cul-de-sacs, and that Emerson might be a person my grandfather had sent letters to, an old war buddy he'd kept in touch with or something. Maybe this Emerson lived in Circle Village, in, in one of the loops, by a graveyard, and one of the letters he'd kept was dated September 3rd, 1940, and that was the one I needed to read. I knew it sounded crazy, but crazier things have turned out to be true. So after hitting dead ends online, I went to the Circle Village Community Centre where the old folks gather to play shuffleboard and discuss the most recent surgeries to ask where the graveyard was and whether anyone knew a Mr Emerson. They looked at me like I had a second head growing out of my neck, baffled that a teenage person was speaking to them. There was no graveyard in Circle Village and no one in the neighbourhood named Emerson and no street called Loop Drive or Loop Avenue or Loop Anything it was a complete bust. Still, Dr. Golan wouldn't let me quit. He suggested I look into Ralph Waldo Emerson, a supposedly famous poet. Emerson wrote his fair share of letters, he said. Maybe that's what your grandfather was referring to. It seemed like a shot in the dark, but just to get Golan off my back, one afternoon I had my dad drop me at the library so I could check it out. I quickly discovered that Ralph Waldo Emerson had indeed written a lot of letters that had been published. For about three minutes I got really excited, like I was close to a breakthrough, and then two things became apparent. First, that Ralph Waldo Emerson had lived and died in the 1800s, and therefore could not have written any letters dated September 3rd, 1940. And second, that his writing was so dense and arcane that I couldn't possibly have held the slightest interest it couldn't possibly have held the slightest interest for my grandfather, who wasn't exactly an avid reader. I discovered Emerson's soporific qualities the hard way by falling asleep with my face in the book, drooling all over an essay called Self-Reliance and having the vending machine dream for the sixth time that week. I woke up screaming and was unceremoniously ejected from the library, cursing Dr. Golan and his stupid theories all the while. The last straw came a few days later when my family decided it was time to sell Grandpa Portman's house. Before prospective buyers could be allowed inside though, the place had to be cleaned out. On the advice of Dr. Golan, who thought it would be good for me, for me to confront the scene of my trauma, I was enlisted to help my dad and Aunt Susie sort through the detritus. 
For a while after we got to the house, my dad kept taking me aside to make sure I was okay. Surprisingly, I seemed to be, despite the scraps of police tape clinging to the shrubs and the torn screen on the lanai flapping in the breeze. These things, like the rented dumpster that stood on the curb, waiting to swallow what remained of my grandfather's life, made me sad, not scared. Once it became clear I wasn't about to suffer a mouth-frothing freakout, we got down to business. Armed with garbage bags, we proceeded grimly through the house, emptying shelves and cabinets and crawl spaces, discovering geometrics of dust beneath objects, unmoved for years. We built pyramids of things that could be saved or salvaged and pyramids of things destined for the dumpster. My aunt and father were not sentimental people and the dumpster pile was always the largest. I lobbied hard to keep certain things, like the eight-foot stack of water-damaged National Geographic magazines teetering up in the corner of the garage. How many afternoons had I spent poring over them, imagining myself among the mud, the mud men of New Guinea or discovering a cliff-top castle in the kingdom of Bhutan. But I was always overruled. Neither was I allowed to keep my grandfather's collection of vintage bowling shirts. They're embarrassing, my dad claimed. And the big hand and swing 78s. His big band and swing 78s. Someone will pay good money for those. Or the contents of his massive, still locked weapons cabinet. You're kidding, right? I hope you're kidding. I told my dad he was being heartless. My aunt fled the scene, leaving us alone in the study where we'd been sorting through a mountain of old financial records. I'm just being practical. This is what happens when people die, Jacob. Yeah? How about when you die? Should I burn all your old manuscripts? He flushed. I shouldn't have said it. Mentioning his half-finished book projects was definitely below the belt. Instead of yelling at me, though, he was quiet. I brought you along today because I thought you were mature enough to handle it. I guess I was wrong. You are wrong. You think getting rid of all Grandpa's stuff will make me forget him? But it won't. He threw up his hands. You know what? I'm sick of fighting about it. Keep whatever you want. He tossed a sheaf of yellowed paper at my feet. Here's an itemised schedule of deductions from, year Kennedy was from the year Kennedy was assassinated. Go have it framed. I kicked away the papers and walked out, slamming the door behind me, and then waited in the living room for him to come out and apologise. When I heard the shredder roar to life, I knew he wasn't going to, so I stomped across the house and locked myself in the bedroom. It smelled of stale air and shoe leather and my grandfather's slightly sour cologne. I leaned against the wall, my eyes following a trail worn into the carpet between the door and the bed, where a rectangle of muted sun caught the edge of a box that poked out from beneath the bedspread. I went over and knelt down and pulled it out. It was the old cigar box, enveloped in dust, as if he'd left it there just for me to find. Inside were the photos I knew so well, the invisible boy, the levitating girl, the boulder lifter, the man with a face painted on the back of his head. They were brittle and peeling, smaller than I remembered too, and looking at them now... As an almost adult, it struck me how blatant the fakery was. A little burning and dodging was probably all it took to make the invisible boy's head disappear. The giant rock being hoisted by that suspiciously scrawny kid could have easily made, been made out of plaster or foam. But these observations were too subtle for a six-year-old, especially one who wanted to believe. Beneath those photos were five more that Grandpa Portman had never shown me. I wondered why until I looked closer. Three were so obviously manipulated that even a kid would have seen through them. One was a laughable double exposure of a girl trapped in a bottle. Another showed a levitating child suspended by something hidden in the dark doorway behind her. A third was a dog with a boy's face pasted crudely onto it. As if these weren't bizarre enough, the last two were like something out of David Lynch's nightmares. One was an unhappy young contortionist doing a frightening backbend. In the other, a pair of freakish twins were dressed in the weirdest costumes I'd ever seen. 
Even my grandfather, who'd filled my head with stories of tentacle-tongued monsters, had realised images like these would give any kid bad dreams. Kneeling there on my grandfather's dusty floor with those photos in my hands, I remembered how betrayed I'd felt the day I realised his stories weren't true. Now the truth seemed obvious. His last words had been just another sleight of hand, and his last act was to infect me with nightmares and paranoid delusions that would take years of therapy and metabolism wrecking medications to rout out. I closed the box and brought it into the living room, where my dad and aunt Susie were emptying a drawer full of coupons, clipped but never used, into a 10-gallon trash bag. I offered up the box. They didn't ask what was inside. So that's it, Dr. Golan said. His death was meaningless. I'd been lying on the couch watching a fish tank in the corner and one, its one golden prisoner swimming in lazy circles. Unless you've got a better idea, I said. Some big theory about what it all means that you haven't told me. Otherwise... What? Otherwise, this is just a waste of time. He sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose as if trying to dispel a headache. What your grandfather's last words meant isn't my conclusion to draw, he said. It's what you think that matters. That is such psycho babble bullshit, I spat. It's not what I think that matters, it's what's true. But I guess we'll never know, so who cares? Just dope me up and collect the bill. I wanted him to get mad, to argue, to insist I was wrong. But instead, he sat poker-faced, drumming the arm of his chair with his pen. It sounds like you're giving up, he said after a moment. I'm disappointed. You don't strike me as a quitter. Then you don't know me very well, I replied. I could not have been less in the mood for a party. I'd known I was in for one of the moment, in for one, the moment my parents began dropping unsubtle hints about how boring and uneventful the upcoming weekend was sure to be, when we all knew perfectly well I was turning 16. I'd begged them to skip the party this year because, among other reasons, I couldn't think of a single person I wanted to invite, but they were worried that I spent too much time alone, clinging to the notion that socialising was therapeutic. So was electroshock, I reminded them but my mother was loath to pass up even the flimsiest excuse for a celebration. She once invited friends over for our cockatiel's birthday, in part because she loved to show off our house. Wine in hand, she'd heard guests from room to overfurnished room, extolling the genius of the architect and telling war stories about the construction. It took months to get these sconces from Italy. We'd just come home from my disastrous session with Dr Golan, I was following my dad into our suspiciously dark living room as he muttered things like, what a shame we didn't plan anything for your birthday. And, oh well, there's always next year. When all the lights flooded on to reveal streamers, balloons and a motley assortment of aunts, uncles, cousins I rarely spoke to, anyone my mother could cajole into attending, and Ricky, whom I was surprised to see lingering near the punch bowl, looking comically out of place in a studded leather jacket. Once everyone had finished cheering and I'd finished pretending to be surprised, my mum slipped her arm around me and whispered, Is this okay? I was upset and tired and just wanted to play War Spire 3, the summoning, before going to bed with the TV on. But what were we going to do? Send everyone home? I said it was fine and she smiled as if to thank me. Who wants to see the new edition? She sang out, pouring herself some Chardonnay before marching a troop of relatives up the stairs. Ricky and I nodded to each other across the room, wordlessly agreeing to tolerate the other's presence for an hour or two. We hadn't spoken since the day he nearly shoved me off the roof, but we both understood the importance of maintaining the illusion of having friends. I was about to go talk to him when my Uncle Bobby grabbed me by the elbow and pulled me into a corner. Bobby was a big barrel-chested guy who drove a big car and lived in a big house and would eventually succumb to a big heart attack from all the foie gras and monster-thick burgers he'd packed into his colon over the years, leaving everything to my hothead cousins, 
and his tiny, quiet wife. He and my uncle, Les, were co-presidents of Smart Aid, and they were always doing this, pulling people into corners for cons uh, conspiratorial chats, as if plotting a mob hit rather than complimenting the, house, uh, the hostess on her guacamole. So, your mum tells me you're going, you're really turning the corner with the, on this whole grandpa thing. My thing. No one knew what to call it. Acute stress reaction, I said. What? That's what I had. Have. Whatever. That's good. Real good to hear. He waved his hand as if putting all the unpleasantness behind us. So your mum and I were thinking, how'd you like to come up to Tampa this summer? See how the family business works. Crackheads with me at HQ for a while. Unless you love stocking shelves. He laughed so loudly that I took an involuntary step backwards. You could even stay at the house. Do a little tarpon fishing with me and your cousins on the weekends. He then spent five long minutes describing his new yacht, going into elaborate, almost pornographic detail, as if that alone were enough to close the deal. When he finished, he grinned and stuck his hand out for me to shake. So what do you think, J-Dog? I guess it was designed to be an offer I couldn't refuse but I'd have rather spent the summer in a Siberian labour camp than live with my uncle and his spoiled kids. As for working at Smart Aid HQ, I knew it was probably inev an inevitable part of my future, but I'd been counting on at least a few more summers of freedom and four years of college before I had to lock myself into a corporate cage. I hesitated, trying to think of a graceful way out. Instead, what I said was, I'm not sure my psychiatrist would think it's such a great idea right now. His bushy eyebrows came together, nodding vaguely. He said, oh, well, sure, of course. We'll just play it by ear then, pal. How's that sound? And then he walked off without waiting for an answer, pretending to see someone across the room whose elbow he needed to grab. My mother, my mother announced it was time to open presents. She always insisted I do this in front of everyone, which was a problem because... As I may have mentioned already, I'm not a good liar. That also means I'm not good at feigning gratitude for re-gifted CDs of country Christmas music or subscriptions to Field and Stream. For years, Uncle Les had laboured under the baffling delusion that I am outdoorsy. But for decorum's sake, I forced a smile and held up each unwrapped trinket for all to admire under a pile of presents left on the coffee table. Uh, until the pile of presents left on the coffee table had shrunk to just three. I reached for the smallest one first. Inside was the key to my parents' four-year-old luxury sedan. They were getting a new one, my mum explained, so I was inheriting the old one. My first car. Everyone oohed and aahed, but I felt my face go hot. It was too much like showering. It was too much like showing off to accept such a lavish present in front of Ricky, whose car cost less than my monthly allowance at age 12. It seemed like my parents were always trying to get me to care about money but I didn't, really. Then again, it's easy to say you don't care about money when you have plenty of it. The next present was the digital camera I'd begged my parents for all last summer. Wow, I said, testing the weight in my hand. This is awesome. I'm outlining a new bird book, my dad said. I was thinking maybe you could take the pictures. A new book, my mum exclaimed. That's a phenomenal idea, Frank. Speaking of which, what happened to the last book you were working on? Clearly she'd had a few glasses of wine. I'm still ironing out a few things, my dad replied quietly. Oh, I see. I could hear Uncle Bobby snickering. Okay, I said loudly, reaching for the last present. This one's from Aunt Susie. Actually, my aunt said as I began tearing away the wrapping paper, it's from your grandfather. I stopped mid-tear. The room went dead quiet, people looking at Aunt Susie as if she'd invoked the name of some evil spirit. My dad's jaw tensed and my mum shot back the last of her wine. Just open it and you'll see, Aunt Susie said. I ripped away the rest of the wrapping paper to find an old hardback book, dog-eared and missing its dust jacket. It was The Selected Works of Ralph Waldo Emerson. I stared at it as if trying to read through the cover, unable to comprehend how it could come to occupy my now trembling hands. 
No one but Dr. Golan knew about the last words, and he'd promised on several occasions that unless I threatened to guzzle Drano or do a backflip off the Sunshine Skyway Bridge, everything we talked about in his office would be held in confidence. I looked at my aunt, a question on my face that I didn't quite know how to ask. She managed a weak smile and said, I found it in your grandfather's desk when we were cleaning out the house. He wrote your name in the front. I think he meant for you to have it. God bless Aunt Susie. She had a heart after all. Neat. I didn't know your grandpa was a reader, my mum said, trying to lighten the mood. That was thoughtful. Yes, my dad said through clenched teeth. Thank you, Susan. I opened the book. Sure enough, the title page bore an inscription in my grandfather's shaky handwriting. The Selected Works of Ralph Waldo Emerson Edited and with an introduction by Clifton Durrell, PhD To Jacob Magellan Portman and the Worlds He Has Yet to Discover Anthem Books, New York I got up to leave, afraid I might start crying in front of everyone, and something slipped out from between the pages and fell to the floor. I bent to pick it up. It was a letter. Emerson. The letter. I felt the blood drain from my face. My mother leaned towards me with a tense whisper and asked if I needed a drink of water, which was mum speak for, keep it together, people are staring. I said, I feel a little, uh... And then, with one hand over my stomach, I bolted to my room. The letter was handwritten on fine, unlined paper, in looping script so on it it was almost calligraphy, the black ink varying in tone like that of an old fountain pen. It read, Dearest Abe, I hope this note finds you safe and in the best of health. It's been such a long time since we last received word from you. But I write not to admonish, only to let you know that we still think of you often and pray for your well-being, our brave, handsome Abe. As for life on the island, little has changed, but quiet and orderly is the way we prefer things. I wonder if we would recognise you after so many years, though I'm certain you'd recognise us, those few who remain, that is. It would mean a great deal to have an ancient, uh, to have a recent picture of you, if you've one to send. To send, I've included a positively, a, a positively ancient snap of myself. And oh, E misses you terribly. Won't you write to her, with respect and admiration? Headmistress Alma Lafay Peregrine. As promised, the writer had enclosed an old snapshot. I held it under the glow of my desk lamp, trying to read some detail in the woman's silhouetted face, but there was none to find. The image was so strange, and yet it was nothing like my grandfather's pictures. There were no tricks here, it was just a woman a woman smoking a pipe. It looked like Sher a Sherlock Holmes pipe, curved and drooping from her lips. My eyes kept coming back to it. Was this what my grandfather had meant for me to find? Yes, I thought. It has to be. Not the letters of Emerson, but a letter tucked inside Emerson's book. But who was this headmistress, this peregrine woman? I studied the envelope and return address, but found only a fading postmark that read Carnholm Island, Kymaru, UK. UK? That was Britain. I knew from studying atlases as a kid that Symaru meant Wales. Carnholm is had to be the island Miss Peregrine had mentioned in her letter. Could it have been the same island where my grandfather lived as a boy? Nine months ago, he told me to find the bird. Nine years ago, he'd sworn that the children's home was where, where he lived was protected by one, a bird who smoked a pipe. At age seven, I'd taken this statement literally, but the headmistress in the picture was smoking a pipe and her name was Peregrine, a kind of hawk. 
What if the bird my grandfather wanted me to find was actually the woman who'd rescued him, the headmistress of the children's home? Maybe she was still on the island after all these years, old as dirt, but sustained by a few of her wards. Children who'd grown up but never left. For the first time, my grandfather's last words began to make a strange kind of sense. He wanted me to go to the island and find this woman, his old headmistress. If anyone knew the secrets of his childhood, it would be her. But the envelope's postmark was 15 years old. Was it possible she was still alive? I did some quick calculations in my head. If she'd been running a children's home in 1939 and was, say, 25 at the time, then she'd be in her late 90s today. So it was possible? There were people older than that in Englewood who still lived by themselves and drove. And even if Miss Peregrine had passed away in the time since she'd sent the letter, there might still be people on Carnholm who could help me. People who had known Grandpa Portman as a kid. People who knew his secrets. We, she had written, those few who remain. As you can imagine, convincing my parents to let me spend part of my summer on a tiny island off the coast of Wales was no easy task. They, particularly my mother, had many compelling reasons why this was a wretched idea, including the cost, the fact that I was supposed to spend the summer with Uncle Bobby learning how to run a drug empire, and that I had no one to accompany me, since neither of my parents had any interest in going, and I certainly couldn't go alone. I had no effective rebuttals, and my reason for wanting to make the trip, I think I'm supposed to, wasn't something I could explain without sounding even crazier than I already feared I was. I certainly wasn't going to tell my parents about Grandma Por Grandpa Portman's last words, or the letter or the photo. They would have had me committed. The only sane-sounding arguments I could come up with thing were things like, I want to learn more about our family history, and the never-persuasive, Chad Kramer and Josh Bell are going to Europe this summer, why can't I? I brought these up as frequently as possible without seeming desperate, even once resorting to, it's not like you don't have the money, a tactic I instantly regretted, but it looked like it wasn't going to happen. Then several things happened that helped my case enormously. First, Uncle Bobby got cold feet about my spending the summer with him, because who wants a nutcase living in their house? So my schedule was suddenly wide open. Next, my dad learned that Carnholm Island is a super important bird habitat, and like half the, ward, the world's population of some bird that gives him a total orth ornithology boner lives there, he started talking a lot about his hypothetical new bird book, and whenever the subject came up, I did my best to encourage him and sound interested. But the most important factor was Dr. Golan. After a surprisingly minimal amount of coaxing by me, he shocked us all by not only signing off on the idea, but also encouraging my parents to let me go. It could be important for him, he told my mother after a session one afternoon. It's a place that's been so mythologised by his grandfather that visiting could only serve to demystify it. He'll see that it's just as normal and as, un as unmagical as any place else, and by extension his grandfather's fantasies will lose their power. It could be a highly effective way of combating fantasy with reality. But I thought he already didn't believe that stuff, my mother said, turning to me. Do you, Jake? I don't, I assured her. Not consciously he doesn't, Dr. Golan said, but it's his unconscious that's causing him problems right now. The dreams, the anxiety. And you really think going there could help? My mother said, narrowing her eyes at him, as if readying herself to hear the unvarnished truth. When it came to things I should or should not be doing, Dr. Golan's word was law. I do, he replied. And that was all it took. After that, things fell into place with astonishing speed. Plane tickets were bought, schedules scheduled, plans laid. My dad and I would go for three weeks in June. I wondered if that was too long, but he claimed he needed at least that much time to make a thorough study of the island's bird colonies. I thought mum would object. Three whole weeks? But the closer our trip got, the more excited for us she seemed. My two men, she would say, beaming, off on a big adventure. I found her enthusiasm kind of touching, actually. 
until the afternoon I overheard her talking on the phone to a friend, venting about how relieved she'd be to have her life back for three weeks and not have two needy children to worry about. I love you too, I wanted to say with as much hurtful sarcasm as I could muster, but she hadn't seen me and I kept quiet. I did love her, of course, but mostly just because loving your mum is mandatory, not because she was someone I think I'd like very much if I met her walking down the street, which she wouldn't be anyway. Walking is for poor people. During the three-week window between the end of school and the start of our trip, I did my best to verify that Miss Alma Lafay Peregrine still resided among the living, but internet searches turned up nothing. Assuming she was still alive, I had hoped to get her on the phone and at least warn her that I was coming, but I soon discovered that almost no one in Carnholm even had a phone. I found only one number for the entire island, so that's the one I dialed. It took nearly a minute to connect, the line hissing and clicking, going quiet, then hissing again, so that I could feel every mile of the vast distance my call was spanning. Finally, I heard that strange European ring. Wop, 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 wop. And a man who I could only assume was profoundly intoxicated answered the phone. Pisshole, he bellowed. There was an unholy amount of noise in the background, the kind of dull roar you'd expect at the height of a raging frat party. I tried to identify myself, but I don't think he could hear me. Piss hole, he bellowed again. Who's this now? But before I could say anything, he'd pulled the receiver away from his head to shout at someone. I said shut up, you dozy bastards. I'm on the... And then the line went dead. I sat with the receiver to my ear for a long, puzzled moment, then hung up. I didn't bother calling back. If Carnholm's only phone connected to some den of in iniquity called the Pisshole, how did that bode for the rest of the island? Would my first trip to Europe be spent evading drunken maniacs and watching birds evacuate their bowels on rocky beaches? Maybe so. But if it meant that I'd finally be able to put my grandfather's mystery to rest and get on with my unextraordinary life, anything I had to endure would be worth it.